we're talking about Hong Kong, because over the weekend protesters did the impossible and found out a way to make air travel even more unbearable. Our democracy is broken, I know, let's go protest at the international airport. I'm sure security will be light and we can hand out pamphlets next to the Hare Krishnas. This protest did do its job though because we're talking about it today. For the past 10 weeks, a massive non-stop protest has been going on in Hong Kong over their democracy. Because as it just so happens, China seems to have a knack for winning every single election in Hong Kong since Hong Kong became a democracy, in both their legislative and executive branches. Either China is a lot more popular in Hong Kong than everybody thought, or something else is going on here. Spoiler alert for the news. But something else is going on here. In this episode, I'm going to lay out the grievances of the protesters and what could happen next. First though, what's wrong? Full disclosure, this episode will be similar to one I did about a month ago. But don't worry, it's a little clearer and there are all new jokes involved. Now just like I always say, there's one thing that consistently proves true. If ever there's regional strife today, chances are you can trace it back to a presumably monocled British man, a pen, and a map. For this story, we have to go back to 1997, because well, in 1897, Great Britain had signed a 100 year lease on Hong Kong, and it was about to expire. At this point, the sun had set on the British Empire, and they were really just looking to get their security deposit back on that lease. The British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, exchanged the final documents in December with the Chinese Prime Minister, Zhao Ziyang. Britain acknowledges that when the lease runs out in 1997 on most of the territory, the whole of Hong Kong will revert to China. And then the whole of Hong Kong reverted back to China. Episode over. Okay, not really. Great Britain, being a country that's truly great at overstaying their welcome, negotiated a one country, two systems agreement with China over the governance for Hong Kong. Now the first thing you'll notice in that agreement is it only lasts 50 years. When, sorry Hong Kong, but it's back to one country, one system again. And I'll just put it this way, I wouldn't be scheduling any flights into Hong Kong's international airport anytime around the year 2047. More importantly though, what was the substance of that deal? Well, it created a special Hong Kong constitution, also known as the Basic Law, and it comes with this fancy cover page. Man, I wish our founders knew how to use Photoshop, all we have is a scroll. The key points to this law are, Article 1, Hong Kong is an inalienable part of the People's Republic of China. Inalienable? China, you're coming off a little desperate on this one. Play it cool. Important to note though, yeah, Britain, looks like they're not going to renew your lease. The negotiated constitution then goes on to list the important attributes of Hong Kong that are so hotly contested today. The National People's Congress authorizes Hong Kong to exercise a high degree of autonomy and enjoy executive, legislative, and independent judicial power. It's at this point that some of you might begin to see where China winning every election might begin to be a problem. Then the constitution lays out Hong Kong residents' rights. Now this part might not sound relevant right now, but believe me, we'll come back to it about halfway through the episode. Hong Kong residents shall have freedom of speech, of the press, and of publication. Freedom of association, of assembly, of procession, and of demonstration. And bet China really regrets that last one. So okay, pretty important then. I mean it sounds like everything China is infamous for is banned in Hong Kong. So what's the problem? Now, Chinese President Xi Jinping has thrown Beijing's full support behind the incoming chief executive of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam. Yup, nothing to see here, just another Beijing back candidate winning in Hong Kong. But why? Either I grossly misunderstand the divide between Hong Kong and the mainland, or something else here is happening. Well, when you create a democracy, you really need to make sure you stick the landing on how people vote. In this case... Regarding voting rights, the constitution says, and brace yourself for this wall of text, 
The method for selecting the chief executive shall be specified in the light of the actual situation in Hong Kong, in accordance with the principle of gradual and orderly progress. The ultimate aim is universal suffrage. Now let me translate that from English to American. Hey, the goal here is one person, one vote, but these things take time. I mean, we were a colony up until 1997. You gotta cut us some slack. Of all the parts of your constitution to leave vague though, it had to be the transition to one person, one vote. The current constitutional implementation strategy here is, eh, we're gonna play this one by ear. Currently, as Brookings points out, the electorate was not the 7.3 million residents of Hong Kong, but rather a 1,194 person election committee. Lam was clearly Beijing's preferred choice and the fact that she secured 777 votes illustrated that the pro-Beijing camp, which holds a majority of seats in the election committee, unified around her. Man, yet another electoral college going against the popular vote. Beijing was really rocking the vote for their candidate and they hold a majority of voters in the small block, so their chosen leader remains undefeated. So okay. We know how China gets the presidents they want, but how do they keep getting the congresses they want? Well, this was coverage of their most recent 2016 election in Hong Kong. They don't want the legislative council to be held by the pro-Beijing groups, which is the majority right now as it stands. But as I mentioned, if the pro-democracy camp reaches the one-third um, amount of seats, they have a right and they have more of a voice um, to have a say on uh, pro-Beijing plans. Yes, somehow in a democracy, the pro-democracy party's goal was to get one-third of the seats. Well, the people have voted and turns out they don't want to. The pro-democracy party was able to pass that one third threshold, so now they have enough votes to veto legislation. This is a major victory as Hong Kong's Congress can finally do what Congress does best and slow everything down. I'm only half joking because with a pro-Beijing majority in Congress and a pro-Beijing president, the best they can hope for is yelling out veto more times than an Italian family trying to come up with baby names. Okay, that joke was a bit of a stretch. Why is it such a struggle though? Well, because only half the seats in the legislature are filled by popular elections. Most of the other half of the seats are filled by industry and business groups. And China's booming economy means Beijing enjoys greater leverage over the Hong Kong economy, now even more than it did a decade ago, especially in finance. And this is where things get interesting, because while everything I've talked about so far has probably led you to think, well, if Hong Kong is controlled by Beijing politicians who can pass any bill they want, how, after more than 20 years of losing British flags, do they still have any rights? Well, there's one branch of government I haven't mentioned yet that remains entirely independent. This does not mean that in the determination of cases, the courts will look to what sectors of the public, or even the majority of the public, or even the government may desire as the outcome in any given case. Whew, we on That's All I Have to Say About That love a good Supreme Court and an independent judiciary. Woohoo! Remember when I said that the rights enshrined in that constitution are going to come back later in the episode? Well, this is that later point. While Congress's job is to pass laws and the president's job is to enforce laws and sign off on them, it's the court's job to make sure everything everybody else does is on the up and up with regard to the constitution. Now this puts Hong Kong politics in an interesting standstill. Because while things won't progress because of Beijing's power, they also can't regress much because the constitution made these rights pretty clear. So if you're making a law that would infringe on, say, someone's rights to peacefully assemble, well, the courts are going to shut that down because that right is explicitly enshrined in the constitution. So this is what makes Hong Kong such a politically volatile place. The people have extremely protected rights to protest, speak, assemble, produce news, and do all of the things Americans do, but they have almost no representation in their government. Their current demand is 
protesters are again rallying in Hong Kong, this time to demand the city's pro-Beijing leader, Carrie Lam, step down. Hong Kong residents want a new leader the only way they know how. Protest. Hey, voting isn't getting you anywhere. Now this hasn't happened yet, but after shutting down an international airport, the world is starting to take notice again. They're calling for full democracy in the territory and universal suffrage. Something that, well, the constitution says is the goal, but the Beijing controlled legislature and president seem to be taking their sweet, sweet time implementing. The next question is, what's gonna happen now? These intense protests have been going on for more than 10 weeks and do not show any signs of dying down. The most recent developments are, first, a Chinese state television channel has published a video claiming in no unsubtle terms to show the police taking part in a large exercise near the border with Hong Kong. Of course, the problem with this is, while China has no problem operating in the gray area of their 1997 agreement, Hey, all the politicians like us. It's not our fault we're popular. This intervention would be a direct violation of their Hong Kong 1997 agreement. A United States State Department official urged China to respect the agreement it made when taking control of Hong Kong from the UK and allow the city to exercise a high degree of autonomy. At the same time, the Prime Ministers of Canada and Australia have also called for Hong Kong's leaders to seek de-escalation by listening to local concerns. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, so you're saying the only thing keeping China out of Hong Kong right now is Western countries saying, eh, I'm not sure I'd do that if I were you. Well, there's one other very important factor at play. With major protests taking place in Hong Kong related to fears of Beijing overreach, American lawmakers are re-examining the U.S. relationship with Hong Kong, specifically if Hong Kong should still be considered as autonomous from China. Now that might sound like a small issue, but it's huge. Hong Kong can get away with a lot of things China can't because they're not communist. They've got comparably free markets that China cannot intervene into, one of the largest stock markets, and an independent judiciary for business claims. If countries legally stop seeing Hong Kong as an autonomous region, that could freeze a lot of credit for Chinese companies taking loans from abroad, as Hong Kong kind of functions as a finance intermediary for China. The new skepticism would be triggered with the repeal of the Hong Kong Policy Act of 1992, an American act that says, sure Hong Kong's related to China, but they're distant cousins, not brothers. We can treat them as separate entities when we're doing business. Looking at the entrenched powers and interests though, most people are saying that this is not going to get resolved anytime soon. Until next escalation, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube! If you want to support independent nonpartisan news, remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the right of my head. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.